This is the Nunjuko, designed by Joe Flowers, produced by Work Tough Gear. One of the best small bushcraft knives I've tested in a long time. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on it, keep watching. All right, just before we get started, I want to thank Vic at Work Tough Gear for sending out the Ninjuko so that I could share it with you. So, you know, um, this has got to be one of the smallest knives that Vic produces. I've looked through their catalog and most of the knives are big choppers, big survival knives, big fighting knives. I love them all without question, but it, this knife really drew my attention because in, at heart, I'm mostly a bushcrafter. And when I saw this, I said, this has got to be as close to perfect a little knife as possible. So what we'll do is we'll bring the camera in a little closer. I'll go through some of the specifications for it and we'll do a few demonstrations. All right, let's get started. So I put the knife back in this sheath because I want to talk about the sheath for a minute so that I can put it aside and focus in on the knife. So let's just take the knife out of the sheath. So, as always, with all of the knives that Vic at Work Tough Gear produces, Kydex done to perfection, without question. It's just, it's just minimalist, you know, little taco-style sheath, but exactly what you need for a knife like this. It has a great push-off, and the seal around, or the press around there, picks up all the details. Okay, so I just want to talk about the sheath and what I've done with it. So this is an Ulti Clip, one of the small ones, because I did carry this in my pocket for a while as an EDC and found it works really well for that. And at the same time, you can set it up for a neck carrier. And that's the way I carried it into the woods for the last uh, number of weeks, is carrying it around my neck like this. I don't even have to take the Ulti Clip off. And if I need to, just take it off my neck, put it in my pocket and attach it there. Either way is legitimate. I wouldn't refer to this as a belt knife. I suppose you could. You could make some kind of an arrangement to make it a bit of a belt knife, but I think it's better as either a pocket knife or as a neck carry. All right, we'll put the sheath out of the way, focus in on the knife itself. So I'm going to give you a few specifications, then of course we'll talk about the design. So overall length for this knife is 7.8 inches from tip to pommel. The blade length is 3.7 inches. The cutting edge is 3.6 inches because there is just a little tiny bit of an unsharpened area right there. The Blade thickness, pretty thin, at 0.11 of an inch. Blade weight, or the knife weight, is 3.9 ounces, but if you add in the sheath, of course, you're probably going to want to know that. 5.25 ounces for the two of them. Now, I will give you all the metric specifications for this knife when in the video description below. All right, now, let's just talk about design. So, the name, Ninjuko, it implies that it's a ninja knife, but a puko knife at the same time. So I guess that also implies that there is Japanese influence as well as Nordic influence on this knife. And when I looked at it, honestly, I struggled to see the Japanese influence. The best I can come up with is that it has somewhat of that complete curvature of a small tanto knife, and that's about all. And I'm talking Japanese tanto, not the Americanized double-edged one up here. A small tanto knife. What I see is pure puko pure Nordic, Nordic Puko with a modern interpretation on it. That's what I see. And that's where this knife excels as carving. It's a carving knife. It's not, when I called it a bushcraft knife, I refer to it as a small bushcraft knife because this is not the do-all bushcraft knife you grab for splitting your firewood or uh, you know all those types of tasks, fire prep. It'll do some fire prep but mostly around scraping. This is a carving knife is what it's best suited for, or an everyday carry knife or a food prep knife. It's pretty good at that. Not the best, but still pretty good. So yeah, now we'll just go over it. Let's take a look at the blade. So you can see it is a slight descent from the handle down. That's not uncommon for Pucos. And a continuous curve all the way up to the tip. That creates a very fine tip on this, as you can see. Very fine. I'm trying, hoping that's picking up on the camera. I can see it refocusing there. Uh, for that reason, I don't baton this knife. It just doesn't make sense to baton a small knife like this with that fine a tip on it. And the other reason is, is it's a full Scandi ground. It has a micro edge. I wonder if I can you can probably see the reflection off the edge, but it is just a micro edge. Now, there is a relief cut here, a fuller that has been machined out just to take some of the weight off of it. I don't think it really makes a difference there. It's more of an aesthetic. At the same time, from where the fuller center of the fuller to the top, it's also been relieved in this direction, just tiny. So it's actually 
the blade looks really thin. It's not quite that thin. Actually, the best way to see the thickness of the blade is just look at the spine. That's how thick the blade is at its widest. Okay, so now we'll move down to the handle. So the handle is a very simple Puko style, no guard on it, as Pukos do not have. They do not have a guard on it. It comes down to a very small bird's beak at the pommel. Um, you're wondering, that looks tiny. Is that that tiny really, Mark? Can you still use that? Well, yes, I can. With my XL hands, I can still use it. I'll talk a little bit more about it. Here's the things I really, really appreciate about this knife. This is canvas micarta, not G10, and you can feel it and the texturing. Not only does it look good, but there is a texture to this that is unlike anything that you'll get on a G10. Perfect for a small knife like this. Looks good and is very functional. Has thumb scallops right up here or finger scallops for a pinch grip, but I prefer them as thumb scallops for carving like this or in that direction. Small lanyard hole. Yeah, a little piece of orange paracord, of course. All right, so there's not much more to show you with this knife. What I want to do with it is just a couple of demonstrations, and it's not going to include batoning. All right, if you can't baton with a knife like this, and I'm not saying you can, I'm just recommending that you don't because it is such a thin knife and you really should have something larger with you if you're trying to process wood into smaller pieces. If you're not going to do that, what are you going to do with it? Curve. It's a carving knife. This has pretty much the same profile as my dedicated carving knives. And I'll just show you a little bit. So if I wanted to carve a spoon with this, I would not feel handicapped by using this knife. It's a little bit stronger. Actually, it's a lot stronger than my carving knife is but almost as capable as it is. But the other thing, of course, is feather sticks. Now, I am going to do a little bit of scraping with it because it does have a wonderful spine on it as well. Little split of pine. That's all I'm going to do is just a few feathers off of this to show you what it's capable of. And, all right, so let's just... This... Oh, my goodness. When you run this knife down... Let me show you... Make sure it's catching all of it. When you start with your knife and you lay it flat and then you lift it to catch the edge, it doesn't take much of a lift to catch the edge on this. And it's just, it's almost without resistance. That's how nice this works. In fact, the trick is don't let it bite in too deep like I just did there. Try to stay as light on the wood as possible. Boy, it's really easy to dig in deep with this knife. It is Scandi ground, but it's ground kind of high compared to most woods uh, knives, most uh, bushcraft knives, which means it gets really thin at the edge. And it runs the risk of being almost too thin, and it would be if it was a true Scandi, a zero ground knife, this would be too thin at the edge to support the strength of the steel. So you do need that secondary bevel on it like this. But at the same time, it makes it for one slicey knife. This is just gliding through the wood. It's not creating real curly curls, but it is going through very, very easily. I'll tell you that, wow. All right, so I've gotten down to there. Now that's all I'm going to do for feathering on this. I'm just going to reposition the camera a tiny bit and show you what it would look like in chest lever. Chest lever cut with this knife, also a dream. And this is where I said, even with my extra large hands, this knife still works. So with my thumb on the thumb scallop, right at the edge of the blade, the handle of the knife does disappear into my palm, but the pommel is very comfortable where it is. And because of the profile of the handle and the roundedness, very comfortable to hold on to. And you're not going to do a whole lot with this knife, this type of carving, but that's for what you are going to do. It's going to work really well. So that's for the feather we just created. Let's just take it right off. That's what I mean. Look how slicey that is. One slice. I wonder if I can do the same thing again. Yeah, see, I could continue to do that all day. I think it's it's just going right through that entire piece of wood in one slice. Now, I'm going to have to pick up another one. This one got a little shorter. I just wanted to show you some carving techniques you could do with it. All right, so I mentioned that this makes a great carving knife. So I just split out a piece of very dry maple here. Now, this is not what I would choose if I was making a spoon. Sometimes that's what you have if you have to make a spoon on the spot. But uh, normally you would start with green wood. Maple is hard regardless, green or dry. That much harder when it's dry. But uh, I split it out nice and thin just so I could show you a little bit of carving that I might do with uh, this knife if I was, was in fact carving a spoon. I'm not 
going to even try to approximate a spoon here, just that concept of what would it look like. And uh, then I have one more demonstration after this. So I'm using the knife in reverse grip like this, and if some, before someone says, yes, it is very safe to do so because the knife cannot touch me, no matter how hard, even if it pulled through the wood, as long as I keep the knife pointed away, it's going to be my hand that comes in contact with the, my chest. And I'm just going to pull the knife along the edge here. Now, this would be representative of maybe thinning the handle out on a spoon. Taking that off now, I can do a little bit. Oh, I'm out of frame. Sorry about that. All right, so didn't do a whole lot there. I just wanted to show you the smooth cut you can get with this. And now you can get some, re if this was the inside of the bowl and the bowl was, we'll say up here, and I wanted to get some really fine finishing cuts, then I can do that with the knife. Little tiny curls. And even better, I can get up near the edge if it was a really tight little radius. And do even better with it because of that thin tip that it has on there. All right, the only other thing I want to show right here is about using it off of your thumb and scissor cut. Because this will, like, like you saw a minute ago, dig in. That's just pulling wood off of this. And this, remember, this is dried maple. Okay, so just a little bit of fun, and it's very easy to get carried away when you start carving like this. So the last thing I want to show you is scraping. All right, last demonstration for the Ninjuko will be scraping. I'll start with just a little bit of fuzz off of this piece of wood. <laughs> has a great edge on it for doing this type of scraping. We'll cut that off. How about fat wood? Find the right edge for doing this. How about this edge right here? Man, that's aggressive. All right, push that all together and of course Wipe it off on my leg. Let's strike it with a ferry rod. And that's all there is to it. Yeah, it scrapes really well. All right, let's wrap this video up with a few more thoughts on the Ninjuko, designed by Joe Flowers and produced by Work Tough Gear. So I want to classify this knife as a bushcraft knife, but I have to be careful in doing so because when most people think of a bushcraft knife, they think of all the tasks you're going to do with a knife out in the woods, including wood processing for a fire. Let's make no mistake, this really is too small or at least too thin on the edge to do any batoning with. I mean, if you did a little bit, you might get away with it, but with an edge that thin, you're running the risk of chipping it out, seriously. Now, having said that, it's good steel. I don't think I mentioned it is Bowler N690, which is, which is a good stainless steel, which has been hardened to 57 to 59 on the Rockwell scale, and then cryo dip. So, good steel without question. Still, it's thin, very, very thin on the edge. It carves exceptionally well, and that's what this knife is really about. This is a crafting knife. I would not hesitate to use this for making spoons or any other small craft that I wanted to do out here in the wood. What I would not do with it, though, is baton or anything that might take that edge and put it at risk. It's why, you know, of course, I've got a much larger cutting tool with me today, so I, I don't need it for those purposes. Okay, those are my thoughts on this knife. I really, really like the looks of it. I really like how it performs. The only thing I'll say about the performance is it's almost too thin, if that makes any sense, at the edge. It's quite a high, thin grind. It really needs that micro bevel. It, uh, as a feather sticking knife, it is great in terms of it sliding through the woods, but Man, it wants to bite in so fast that it's hard to get the super thin curls that other knives can do, at least for me. Maybe I'm just not all that practiced with this one yet. Everything else, though, it feels so good in the hand. It's just, well, it's a nice small knife. What else can I say about it? All right. 
That's everything. Hi, folks. I'm interrupting the ending of this video with a very important message for anyone who is considering purchasing one of the Work Tough Gear Ninjuko knives. When I got home from the woods the day that I recorded this video, I noticed that there was a chip in the edge of the knife. How I didn't see that in the woods, I'm not sure. The only reason I can offer is that I was not wearing my reading glasses as I would normally be doing so. Uh, I immediately reached out to Vic Lynn at Work Tough Gear to try and better understand how this could have happened. Vic advised that he had reports of a few of these knives being having the same issue, edge chipping. In Vic's opinion, the reason is twofold. First, it is the very fine edge geometry, but in combination with the steel choice, the Bowler N690 stainless steel. Now, uh, I was left with the decision to make whether or not to publish this video and put it out there that this has been happening to these knives. For me, the decision was easy. I felt it was important that everybody be aware that this could happen. Now, this may only be limited to the first production run. Vic further advises me that he will be speaking with Joe Flowers, the designer of this knife, to come up with a resolution on how they can produce another run of these knives that will not have the edge chipping. I still stand behind this knife design, but at this time I cannot recommend anyone to purchase one of the first production run that is using the N690 steel. All right, folks, I appreciate your understanding, and we're going to close this video out by, with the traditional. If you have any comments or questions, put them in the comments section below. I'll put all the information I have regarding where you can take another look at this knife in the video description. But get out and explore, and take that path less travel because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.